Hello, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. You're welcome to Better Music. It's our first episode, and I'm super excited about this. Yes, I am. Well, today, if you guess what we're talking about or what our topic is today, you will get a no, no, no. <laughs> it's written right down there. So you already know. So nobody's getting anything. Well, on a serious note, we're talking about microphones. Yes, microphones. Microphones uh, Microphones are one of the fundamentals of sound engineering, if not the fundamental of sound engineering. Think about this. Microphone is the front end between um, the acoustic sound and then um, the electronic and the engineering part of music. Think about this. You want to make it, you want to sing, you need a microphone. You want to play guitar and then you need to capture it. You need to record it, not DI, no. You need to capture the sound from the cabinet, the energy and the air. It means you need a microphone. Your drum, you want to make it louder, you need a microphone. You want to make an an announcement, you need a microphone. A commentator needs a microphone. Think about it. In a party, everybody's loud and then they're shouting. You want to say something, you need a microphone. So, microphone is very, very important in sound engineering. It is very important that you know the types of microphone and how to effectively use them. That is the most important thing, you know. Um... For you as a sound engineer, for you as a um, FOH guy, for you as a vocalist, for you as a music producer, the most important thing for you is that you know the right type of microphones to use and where to position them. I know FOH guy will say, eh, it's just to set up the microphone and then put the microphone in front of singer. Yeah, they need other. No, it's not always true. I'll tell you something. The positioning of your microphone is more important than the type of microphone you you use. Think about it. If we give two um, of the same microphone to two sound engineers to record a song, it will shock you that the both of them, the sound will not be the same. The sound will not be the same. It's the same microphone. Give it to two engineers, not ten you will not get the same sound. Why? They are both professional microphones. They are super amazing. They are the top end thousands of dollars microphone. The thing I tell people is this. See, if you face the best microphone in the world, if you place it close to a wall and put the singer at the other side of the wall, you're still going to get room sound and not the vocalist. So, mic positioning is the key thing as a sound engineer. And it is also important that you know that it's easier said than done because it's a craft and it's also an art. Meaning there's a scientific knowledge of it and then there's the engineering knowledge part of it. Meaning also that you will need to practice a couple of times to um, perfect your craft meaning it will take you to um, it will take you to position here and then you record and you say no this isn't good what if we turn the microphone like this what if we do this what if we do that but what if we do this what if we do that is based on the fact that you understand the microphone you're using so to wrap this segment, is that it is not the type of microphone that makes or breaks your end product. It is how you use the microphone and what microphone are you using. That's where we're going next. See you soon. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. You're welcome back. It's K-Strings. It's Better Music, sponsored by Grace Hill. You're welcome. Talking about microphones, types of microphone. um, First, I like to talk about piezoelectric microphones. 
piezoelectric microphones are made of ceramics and um, crystallines. These ceramics and crystallines, they um, produce low voltage when subjected to pressure or vibration, meaning they can absorb sound, they can sense the vibration and um, the sound pressure from the source, from whatever source it is you're um, using, using them for to generate very low voltage. Low voltage equals high impedance. You know that. It's a bit of physics. Yeah. So low voltage, high impedance. And then this low voltage needs a preamplifier to amplify that voltage for you to convert it to sound energy when it goes to your guitar amp, when it goes to your um, amplifier, so to say. Imagine your um, acoustic electric guitar Good example, you just plug the jack in and then you strum your guitar. It has small amplifiers somewhere on top of the guitar here. And then you just strum your guitar. Guess what? As you strum the guitar, the microphone, which is embedded somewhere at the bridge of your guitar, somewhere it's usually slanted this long, it's there just by the bridge of your guitar, senses this vibration and then send this vibration quickly to the preamplifier which is powered by a nine volt battery to amplify that tiny volts coming from the vibrations and then through your jack plug and it goes straight to your amplifier or your guitar amp. That explains piezo. Piezo, also known as contact, don't forget, contact microphones, they call them. So they're quite, you see them more in percussive instruments or instruments that have body that can vibrate, you know, so that they sense it. Second, I want to talk about um, dynamic microphones. Dynamic microphones, yes, we all know dynamic microphones. The popular one we use in the church, the SM57, SM50, SM58, the Electro Voice, the Sennheiser makes quite a lot too. I think Sennheiser's too. Um, there are quite a lot of dynamic microphones, which will be the most popular microphone. Dynamic microphone. Dynamic from the word dynamo. Dynamo talks about dynamic it's, there's a movement. So it's talking about diaphragms with coils around them, small physics, diaphragms with coils around them, moving around a magnetic field. See, it makes a lot of sense. So the diaphragm are very thin nylon-like material, and then they have this tiny wire wound around them, and then this wire sits in um, a, a kind of magnetic field, I wish I had one destroyed now. So no, just not destroyed, torn apart. So you see it. So this sits in this um, magnetic field. So when you talk, when you say hello, hello, the diaphragm moves back and forth, back and forth. So it sends um, the, the, the coil, so they say the wire coil moves around the magnet to generate what is called current and then when it generates this current this current is goes into your amplifier thereby it's been amplified and converted back to sound energy so you can hear that's much about um what's it called that's pretty much about um dynamic microphones dynamic microphone microphones are um they can they don't need to be they don't need to be pre-amplified because um there is a lot of movement and then this movement can generate um quite quite a good amount of um, current. And then it will shock you that it can go for as long as, um, I think it's about 100 meters. Yes, about 100 meters. So for a dynamic microphone, the wire can be as long as 100 meters before it gets to the next amplifier or your mixer. That's why you could plug them into those snake cables and then we find out that the stage is way far ahead of you and then it won't still lose quality. But I think from about 100 meters thereabout, you start to lose the high frequency of the microphone. Two, fantastic. Dynamic mic, that's all you need to know. There's another kind of microphone called the um, um, ribbon microphone. Ribbon microphones, just imagine that um, all of the um, diaphragm and all of that that we've talked about is being replaced by a ribbon. Ribbons are delicate. They make them with some kind of metal ribbons. So they are like um, they are like squashed papers. How do I explain this? Um, give me a second. I'll look for one for you very soon. So they are usually like squashed papers. I could just do that right away so we don't waste time. 
So, yeah, this, so you see how it looks. So it's usually that this is clipped here and then this is clipped here. And then when you talk, you say, hello. So the tiny ribbon vibrates back and forth back. That's ribbon microphone. They also have their kind of tone, their kind of sound. It's, it's slightly warmer. Um, it's said that ribbon microphones have the high end are usually um, rounded off. They're not as bright as the next microphone I'll be talking about. A good example of um, ribbon mic, I think Rhodes makes a very good one. They call it um, Rhodes NTR. We have the um, MXL, the R14. You have the popular Roya R121. And then um, they are very delicate. So the, the diaphragm is, is replaced with um, ribbon. So the next set of microphone I'm going to be talking about is called the capacitor microphone. Yes, the popular one we all call condenser microphone. So condenser microphone are also known as capacitor microphone. Same thing. So the idea between this is just that imagine the dynamic microphones, but instead of you having a magnetic field and this and that, too much complicated stuff, what they do is usually that um, they try to create like a capacitor. You know what capacitor does? Naturally, capacitor store charges. So what you have is that you have a diaphragm to one diaphragm here and another diaphragm here. And then they are enclosed together in one circular metallic structure like this. So they're together. And then there's a plate somewhere here. That's the difference now. You know, in the dynamic microphones, you have coils wound around this, but in um, capacitor, popularly known as condenser microphones, they have plates on, they just have this split slightly attached to the diaphragm and another plate slightly attached to the diaphragm and then they cable them down. And then what they do is that it store charges, it store electricity, it store um, voltage. Let's not do too many physics, but you know that um, the, what's it called now? I think it's, um, it's, it's voltage equal charge over capacity. Yes, a bit of physics. So it's, it has to do with the capacitor, the amount of electron, electrons yeah, stored or charges stored in between those two plates, in between those two diaphragms that has plates behind them. You understand they are that, that way. And then when you talk or the amount, the measure of electrons in between them as you talk, meaning if squash, electron loss, electron back gained, electron loss, electron gain. So the amount of electron in between them and then the amount of charges determines how much the voltage varies, which is also sent into your amplifier that amplifies it. But the difference here is that, you know, when you lose charges, what fills it back? We need to fill back those charges, one. Two, you will notice that because um, the, the, the diaphragm, uh, there's no magnet and then there's no plenty wire on it. So the diaphragms, are, they move freely and faster than the diaphragm of um, a dynamic mic, which has wire wound around it. What does this tell us? Enough physics, Kayade. So, but this is why um, a, a condenser microphone or a capacitor microphone picks every sound, every delicate, no matter how delicate the sound is, a little, it will, because the diaphragm is moving freely. It's not, it doesn't have the weight of being in a magnetic field or coil, blah, 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 around it. So they are, they are considered to be the studio standard most of the time. The studio standard, because they're going to pick um, the tiny little delicate sound. See, but the charges, oh, I said I wasn't going back. I wasn't going to come back to this physics thing, but anyways, you need to know. So these charges, they, you lose charges as this, um, what's it called? The diaphragms go back and forth, back and forth. You lose charges, one. And then you need to store charges on the plates because the plates are going to be charged, isn't it? 
these charges need to be refilled back as soon as there's a loss. Else, imagine it's gone that, nah, and then we need to put back more charges and there's nothing charging anything. Then we'll not have another sound by the time the next um, acoustic sound hits the diaphragm. So they came up with this idea of pairing it with what we, what we now call the fandom power, 48 volts. So every capacitor microphone needs 48 volts to work. So a dynamic mic does not need fandom volts to work. A piezo needs 9 volts, not 48 volts. A capacitor needs 48. For what? So that the charges are back. You put back the charges into it because you lose charges as this diaphragm go back and forth. I hope I've made a lot of sense or I've made any sense at all, if not. And then in capacitor mics, there are no, um, what's it called? There are no magnetic field holding them. That's why they they are very, you notice that they pick, um, they pick sound, the smallest of sound, the smallest pressure that most um, dynamic mic won't pick. The capacitor is going to pick it the brightness of your sound, everything is going to be captured. And usually there are two, there are, there are about three types, if I remember, if I can recall. There's the um, small diaphragm, um, a Rhodes NT28, it's come with slightly a large diaphragm. Electric microphones. Electric microphones, the charges in them are fixed. A lot of people say, yes, they're okay. A lot of people say, no, the high frequencies are compromised. This, this, that, 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 whatever. So most of the time, electric microphones, um, they are used for, you don't find them much, much in the studio, but a lot of people still use electric microphone. The example will be the Shaw 81. The one we usually leave on the hi-hat most of the time. It's, it's long, slim. We forget it on the um, hi-hat. All right, so finally, I'm happy we're done. Oh, there's a tube microphone. The tube microphone, it's still, most of the time, it's a capacitor microphone that runs into a tube. Instead of the sound goes into a tube that warms up, you know, when you bring tube into a sound, tube has a way of warming up the sound. So warms up the sound and give it its own. And then that needs a huge chunk of tube amplifier somewhere else that powers it even before it hits your um, audio interface or before it hits your amplifier or whatever it is you're using. Pretty much about tube. Another thing I'd like to talk about is um, polar patterns or patterns of microphone. Patterns of microphone. Um, okay, just before patterns of microphone, a little recap. Um, we're talking about... With, talked about the um, piezoelectric microphones, we've talked about the rebound microphones, we've talked about the dynamic microphones, we've talked about the um, electric microphones, and then we've talked about the capacitor microphones. Now let's talk about the patterns, because not all microphones function the same way. You're welcome back. So quickly, I will show you some microphones that I have. I'm using my Rhodes NT2A right now, so I may not be able to show you that. That's the microphone for this podcast. So this is a dyne, this is a capacitor microphone. It's a C3 by Behringer. If you look closely at this microphone, you will see that this microphone has a low cut filter. This is called low cut filter. Most microphones have them. Some microphones don't, but most high end, um, well, not really high end, but most microphones got it. They have this. What it does is that it filters out about um, 80 hertz down when you're using it to record it because, of course, it's a capacitor microphone. So, guess what? It's going to peak every damn sound. So what you need to do most of this time is that you need to remove rumbles. You switch it this way. And then that means about 80 hertz, everything 80 hertz down, not really 80 hertz down, but 80 hertz down, it's gone. It's going to filter it out. And then if I return it back this way, guess what? 
its full frequency. It's going to capture every other thing. And then most of the time, because capacitor microphones have the tendency to be very loud, on them, they usually put a place to attenuate the volume. You can see where it says minus 10, minus 10 dB, and then you could put it back to zero. I think the one for NT2 has got really way more than minus 10. I think it has minus four, minus eight, and then all that. Back to what I was going to talk about. What I was going to talk about is um, patterns. Patterns. See, some microphones, if you look at this, this looks like a zero. This looks like a bulging flower, and then this looks like a figure eight. What happens with this is that if I have this selected to the zero, it means that this capacitor microphone is open to, um, to, to take sound from anywhere. So it wouldn't matter if I was standing in the front, to the side, or the back. It's highly sensitive. It's going to absorb any sound, whatever at all. So you have a group of people, you have a group of four or five people, you want them to use one microphone. Fantastic. Put it to that place and then arrange them around the microphone. You're going to record with it. And then the second one is, that's called the Omni. And then the second one is this one in the middle here. It looks like a boarding flower. It's called the Cardioid. The Cardioid meaning it's just going to take sound from the front. It will reject sound from the back. What does this mean? I can record two or more people in a room. If I position them to be card, all cardioids, and then I place the first person to take the sound from this place, and I set up another microphone back in that one this way, because it's going to reject most sound coming from this place. So that person can record this way. So I can have four or five people faced, um, forming almost like a circle. Or if I have two, they just need to face themselves guess what? It's going to reject the sound from the back and only take the sound from the front. If I have it to do this figure eight, figure eight, you'll find the application of figure eight, which is this one. The figure eight, they call it the figure eight. It's this, yes, figure eight. If I use the figure eight to record most application, people think figure eight, yes, what happens in figure eight is that it takes sound from the front. It rejects sound from the side. It rejects sound from the side. So it takes from the front, it takes from the back, but it rejects every sound from this side and from this side. So, which makes a lot of sense. I'll explain this with a guitar. If I'm playing a guitar, an acoustic guitar, and then I have this microphone placed this way, this is the front of the microphone. The front of the microphone is looking at me this way. Meaning every sound from this, it will reject every sound from this side, this side. And it's going to reject sound from here. It only takes from here and from here. So we are two in the room and then we just want to have our session. It's a room recording or whatever recording session. Just And I, who knows, it might just be the take and then that might just be it. You understand? So you you have just one microphone Yes, it is possible. All you need to do is to set it up this way. I speak into the microphone. It takes it from here. Another singer is singing from this side. It's taking it from here. But it's going to reject the sound of my guitar because I have my guitar with another microphone. Patterns. Um, an example of um, dynamic microphone, I have my trusty SM57. Yes, SM57. I've used this on countless tracks. It's fantastic with voice. A lot of people think dynamic microphones are not good for vocals. No. Dynamic microphone, the dynamic micro microphone might just be the only microphone you have in the studio. Guess what? You make great and fantastic record with it. I, I've heard Michael Jackson had, Michael Jackson sang with um, the 7B, is it the Shaw 7B? I've heard great singers use 7B. 7B happens to be a broadcasting microphone, but it's a dynamic microphone. But 7B, is it 7B or B7? It's a Shaw microphone. Fantastic. And in a lot of great hits have been done using this microphone. It's a studio rat. It's one of the best microphones you ever used to record a snare drum. Take it from me and percussion instrument, not just snare drum, congas, 
this will do the work. It will even do the work of a talking drum. Yes, the mid part of a talking drum. Yes, you get it. And the lower mid, it will catch it very well. It just depends on how you position them using um, the patterns on the microphone. So, and then you can see that it's a cardioid. It's already, it's shown, you can see it, that's a cardioid, telling you it's a cardioid. And then straight from the SM57 dynamic microphone. You're welcome back. This is K-Strings, you're watching Better Music, sponsored by Grace Hill. Um, this segment, I wanna talk about um, how to use a microphone and how not to use a microphone. But firstly, I must tell you that a lot of people think you need the $10,000 microphone to make good record. No, it is not that you need a $10,000 microphone. You just need to know how to use a microphone. So it's not a model fight or uh, um, what's it called? It's not a model fight where you say, oh, this model of microphone is better than this model, blah, blah, blah. Everyone is going to sound different because they all have um, different frequency response or the way they respond to frequency most of the time. See, but what is important is that you know the types and how, which is what I want to talk about. So, you don't need a million dollar microphone to make great record. It is how you use it that matters. I'm sure I've said that many times. Good. A good example is that um, I am, let me say this, a lot of people also think that you must own um, a capacitor microphone, a condenser microphone to make great recordings. No, I'll disagree with you because um, you can use your dynamic microphone very well, amplify it very well, and then get great recordings from it also. Because yes, for the longer the wire and then the, the high end disappears, yes, we have all of those factors, but they are great, great, great dynamic microphones. Some vocalists actually sound well on dynamic microphone, handheld, jumping in your studio, than fixed um, condenser or capacitor, um, what's it called, Micro delicate microphone, and then they're just in one place. I've done a couple of recordings in my life where we've used um, the handheld, the old PG-58, trusty PG-58. And guess what? It made good hits, great hits. And I've heard of many hit songs that were um, made with as small as 57, PG-57, um, SM-57. You know, all of these microphones are... It's not a, it's not a it's not a ten thousand dollar microphone that really makes your song. It's how you use it. A good example: imagine you want to record an acoustic guitar, and then this acoustic guitar requires that you mic it. I don't see the reason why you want to use a large diaphragm microphone to record an acoustic guitar, except you want to get um, the room big sound. Because guess what? It, it's not in the mix. Nobody's gonna hear your big room sound, except that the song is centered around the acoustic guitar. Most of the time, you need a small diaphragm microphone. At times, you need an old trusty guy. I've done it with quite a lot of acoustic stuff. So you need probably a dynamic microphone. So if you want the boominess, you position it at the hole of your acoustic guitar. Straight into it, you get the boominess. As you move further away, it thins out. Most time, it is said that if you want to get um, a bright or an even sound for an acoustic guitar, get a small diaphragm microphone, not a large diaphragm microphone, or even get a point. I have I own a Samsung the CL2, the very long, tiny one like this. I think I'll put up a picture of that. The, the CL2 at times does the magic. You just point it towards the hole or you bring it to the body of the guitar just low, low um, underneath the elbow of the player, you get that warm body sound. If you want an even tone, just aim your guitar angled at the 12th fret. Yeah, between the 12th fret and then the hole, there's always a sweet spot for an acoustic guitar recording. I've done uh, plenty using that when I had just one microphone. So one microphone record, you could do also two microphones. Um, two microphones, you have the XY, and then we've also got the mid side. I'm not sure there's going to be time for me to talk about mid side, but um, 
maybe as we go on in some recording techniques, I'll share mid-site with you guys and X, Y, and um, single microphone and how to use that. For um, quick, another one will be that your vocalist, there's something called the proximity effect. You know that if you're too close to the microphone, it gets really, really boomy and um, the low end, your chest and then all of the chest sound, you can hear it in the microphone. Really, really boomy. And then the farther you go, because your voice reacts with the air, and then the brighter it becomes. Simple. It's called the proximity effect. Also, imagine that you're recording a choir. One quick tip. A, a choir, a, a group of people, a choir, so to say. If you're recording a choir, another thing I do with choir is that I push the microphone slightly away from them than normal. Usually, I put my finger this, and I make this. It's about one foot, there about. So it's one foot from the pop filter, one foot from the pop filter, and I let the vocalist sing. And then, you know, also one of the things I do is that some vocalists are very breathy people. They sing with, they, they take too much air and they do, <sighs> while they sing, oh, and then all of that and all of that. Have you ever wondered why most studios, people think it's, was, it's really for fun, but it's not for fun. A lot of people think it's for fun. Have you ever wondered why at times the microphone, it's upside down rather than right side up? So most time when your microphone is this way and I mean it's slightly pointed above just the way it is like this, I tend to stretch a bit to sing, meaning air comes out. I'm going to push air. A lot of air comes out freely and then I sing into the microphone. And when I'm breathing because my nose is channeled down, the breath, the air coming in, most of it doesn't go into the mic rather than if I have the mic this way. So if I have it this way and I do, ah, uh, guess what? A lot of air that is not needed. So you've saved yourself editing time. You've saved yourself a lot of clean, um, what's it called? Comping and cleaning and um, every air you have to bring it down, every breath you have to bring it down. You've saved yourself a lot by just inverting the microphone looking at the artist, but if it's the one that you know that, oh, it's not so much like the other, like um, the one I just explained, you could have the microphone instead. There's nothing wrong with it. As we go on in the class, we'll have plenty of tricks and then um, I'll talk about microphone technique. I hope maybe next week or maybe the week after, I know I'm going to talk about microphone technique and um, for recording drums, acoustic guitar, um, guitar cabinet, that's your combo and um, also do some tricks, some reverb tricks with it. Microphone is an amazing instrument. It's also one of the dullest instruments you have in the studio because guess what? You have to work your microphone. So as a vocalist, you know also that if you cone your microphone, holding the cone of your microphone gives you a honky sound. And then you don't expect to have any high if you're using a dynamic microphone, for example. If I was holding it like rappers do, they do this so that they have that bust of 1K. When you cone your microphone, 1K, 1K meaning 1 kilohertz, you have that honkiness of your microphone. So when you're talking, it's an uh, 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 and it's very super bright and loud. So you as a singer, you're not a rapper, you're singing. And even as a rapper, if you have good amount of compression and if the FOH guy or your sound engineer knows what he's doing, you won't need to cone your microphone. So coning microphone makes it louder, seemingly louder, a lot of distortion and then a lot of the mid frequency. Yes, and then your low is gone and then your high is gone. And it can be disturbing at times. It piercing, it's piercing, sorry. So you don't need to cone microphones. You need to hold microphones this way. Too close to your mouth, they get puffy and then they get very low and then rumbling and then averagely out of your mouth and then you're good to go. Um, I hope I've been able to talk at least a little bit and then history and then you understanding what microphones, a bit of how to use them. Not so much, I know we've not done so much about um, microphone techniques. And then microphone techniques is probably going to be our next class or maybe sometime in the future when I'm able to um, get that done to you. Well, I'm K-Strings. You're watching Better Music. 
subscribe as usual somewhere down here follow me on instagram it's k strings and then follow me on twitter it's k strings or grace hill recordings i'll still get to you if you send me a message you want to send me a message it's k strings at gmail.com or grace hill recordings at gmail.com and then um, if you want to ask me any question please type them down here i'll gladly answer you i'll reply you as soon as i get them all right that'll be all for this week have a lovely time and then have a lovely day enjoy music and make better music Thank you.